Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the curator of public programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. Thank you for joining us today or tonight, depending on where it is you're tuning in from around the world. The Fowler is proud to present today's program, Sandrine Collard on Photo Cameroon, as part of our Lunch and Learn series, which offers easily digestible explorations of charismatic material from around the world. I'm so pleased that you have joined us to chew on some sustenance and feed your mind and soul. The Fowler is pleased to welcome Sandrine Collard, scholar of modern and contemporary African art history and independent curator for today's program, inspired by the images taken by Jacques Toussaint, Joseph Chila and Samuel Finla, featured in Photo Cameroon, studio portraiture 1970 to 1990s, currently on view at the Fowler. Collard will draw on her extensive research in African photography to discuss the advent of the medium on the continent, especially in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Through a comparative approach to early and modern African photography practices, she will highlight the dual practice of photographers from that time who, like the photographers in our exhibition, produce not only state documents, but more personal, intimate portraits. The Fowler's Curator of African Arts, Erica P. Jones, will facilitate the audience question and answer at the end of the program. Before we get going, a little bit about our host today. Sandrine Collard is Assistant Professor of Art History at Rutgers University in Newark, a researcher, independent curator, and historian of modern and contemporary African arts and photography. She divides her time between New York City and Brussels, Belgium. Having received her PhD from Columbia University in 2016, she has lectured internationally and is the author of multiple publications. Collard was the curator of the sixth Lubumbashi Biennial, Future Genealogies, Tales from the Equatorial Line. Her research has been supported by numerous fellowships, including those from Musée du Quai Branly and the Ford Foundation. She is a 2021-22 Getty slash ACLS fellow, working on her book about the history of photography in colonial Congo. I have a few quick technical bits of housekeeping before we get going. Once the screen sharing begins, I encourage you to click view options at the top of your screen and then select side-by-side -side mode so the video feed doesn't cover any of the presentation. And if you have any questions during this program, please do submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit and upvote questions that you would like to be considered to be answered at the end of the program. All right, that's all from me. Over to you, Sandrine. Thank you, Bianca. Uh, I hope you can all hear me well. Thank you very much to the Fowler Museum and to Erica Jones for this invitation to think transversely about Cameroonian photography in relation to my own research about photography in the Congo. It is truly exciting to see projects like this one taking place ensuring the survival of still two little known African photographers works and to make sure that they are seen in exhibitions like Photo Cameroon. Thank you also to all the people in attendance, wherever you are in the world. And if you are indeed having lunch while listening to this presentation, bon appétit. Now, let me share my screen with you all. There you go. The relationship between photography and the post-independence movement on the African continent has an extraordinarily rich history that still needs to be researched more deeply. A lot of scholars, myself included, have studied the African history of the medium at the time of colonial governance, and we have explored how African subjects and picture makers have collaborated in and out of the studio to create portraits of the self that resisted, circumvented, but also sometimes conformed to, or on the contrary, ignored colonial representations. Once the colonial yokes removed, it has mostly been understood that African portraiture entered an altogether different age, an age of liberation from the weight of exoticization 
and inferiorization canonized in the colonial archive. The short set century, um, whose book cover you see here, the groundbreaking exhibition by Okui and Wesor in 2001 was about that freeing. And he showed how not just photography, but a whole range of other media participated in that emancipation movement. Like 15 other nations that year, Congo and Cameroon declared their independence in 1960, the year of Africa, uh, like titled by this New York Times article published last year. The Congo, present-day Democratic Republic of Congo, not to be confused with the former French Congo, the Congo gained its emancipation from Belgium and most of Cameroon became independent from France. For both countries, the three decades that followed were marked by drastically changing political, social, and economical contexts and tumultuous episodes. First, the euphoria and optimism of new nations building, then the regional dissensions, civil wars, and sometimes coup d'etat, the imposition of dictatorial regimes by single party leaders in relation to Cold War's various interests. And finally, the implementation of structural adjustment aids by foreign powers that has most often been seen as a neo-colonialism's deployment. I would like here to put into perspective the post-independence times of both countries by looking side by side at some Jacques Tousselet, Joseph Chila, and Samuel Finlack's images gathered in Photo Cameroon exhibition on one side, next to the pictures of Jean de Barra and Ambroise Ngaimoko from the Congo on the other side. The three Cameroonian photographers practiced in the much smaller towns and villages of Mbuda, Mayo d'Arlé, and Atta in Western and Central Cameroon, by comparison to the bustling capital city of Leopoldville, then renamed Kinshasa, in the Congo, where De Parra and Gaimoku worked their whole life. Yet, there are undeniable parallels to be observed in spite of these different urban contexts and geographical distance. These pictures show various similar elements that hint at a shared decolonial imagination to borrow photo historian Jennifer Bajorek's latest book subtitle at a somewhat pan-African experience of decolonization in African photography. The frequent relocations and training of African photographers across borders since the early days of the medium on the continent might also explain this disregard for national limits. Tuseli was trained by a Nigerian. Both the Bara and Gaimoku were born in Angola, but practiced photography in the Congo, and these exchanges go back to the 19th to the early to the 19th century. Born between 1928 for the oldest Jean de Barra and 1958 for the youngest Samuel Finlack, together all these photographers' practices span a time period that encompasses the dawn of independences up until the 1990s. Several scholars have studied how this transition into independent states meant that identity photographic documents needed to be produced as part of national campaigns. And the work of Jacques Tousselet on view in this slide shows this part of his production. Yet next to these sober, next to this sober frontal and administrative aesthetic, the creation of a new national and emancipated subject seemed to have been also neg negotiated in very different, less polished and less disciplined relationship to one's own body. The large number of images 
portraying men half naked with their bare torso exposed to the camera and often with their muscles ostentatiously flexed in tableau vivant of bodybuilders or combat sport, be it as you see here, martial arts or catch or boxing, these images are ubiquitous, both in Cameroon, in the Congo, but also beyond these two countries in, uh, in Africa. In Ambroise Galmoco's studio, the simple jouissance of the male body is recorded here, touching one's own arm as a gesture of self-care or self-protection. The belt bottom pants contrast with the slim waist of the young man and the flip-flop shoes, a straw hat and slightly unbuttoned trousers make the portrait ooze with easy goingness. Here with a raised fist as a sign of victory or resistance, the sitter wears a very similar outfit than the one seen in the previous image. More visible here is the theatricality of the pose with the spotlights that uh, of course remind Samuel Photo's images and also the imposing shadow created on the back wall. In both these images and the previous one, the bare decor and absence of props make it clear that the body is the subject of the photograph and that the beauty of the body uh, as you can see here, the caption Kitoko written underneath means beautiful in Lingala. So the, the beauty uh, of the body is paramount. Nonchalance, body self-esteem and self-love or again the control of one's own physical force are of course all elements that one is systemically denied under colonial regimes and that these poses spread in studios throughout Africa after 1960 is unsurprising. Even starting before independence, the cocky Jean de Barra in Leopoldville, then Kinshasa, became accustomed to create images of masculinity that subverted the roles assigned to black men in the Belgian Congo. Parading bodybuilders, skin glowing under the sun, making demonstration of their force as a group of men were the radical opposites of the so-called boys who were given um, domestic tasks traditionally assigned to women and whose very name, boys, was belittling and emasculating for grown men. Leisure was similarly reserved for white bodies in a colony where for the longest time, black men were seen exclusively as manpower or labor force, first as carriers, rubber collectors, then industry workers, especially in mines. The reappropriation um, and self-possession in this context, the reappropriation and self-possession of one's own body in the studio or outside of the studio was an integral part of the national subject construction. The number of images showing young boys imitating their seniors in these, uh, in these poses spontaneously or under the direction of the photographer show how intergenerational that uh, project, that masculine project was, all the more after the famous match between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman took place in Kinshasa in 1974. Another common experience linking Cameroon and the Congo is precisely the influence of African-American culture here in the figure of the iconic boxer, Muhammad Ali. But music was as crucial in the formation of post-independence identity of African nations and in the awareness of the rise of global blackness. The regularity of images incorporating, as you see here, uh, tape players and that from the, from the youngest age is significant of the place given to sound in the imagination of the self, something that the images by Sidu Keita and Malik Sidibe were already frequently doing. 
In later portraits, the popularity of African-American superstar Michael Jackson makes him a rival for the president Paul Bia on clothes worn by sitters in the studio. Michael Jackson's beauty, his unequal dance skills, the sensuality of his pose on uh, disc covers reproduced as emblems on t-shirts partake to the same affirmation of the black body, male or female, uh, since we see here on the left, a young lady um, adorned with, with such a t-shirt. It also creates bridges between the continent and its diaspora through music. Scholar Tsitsi Elajaji has studied what she called stereo modernism, that is how black music's back and forth between the continent and black America, black Europe, the Caribbean, etc., promoted solidarity and a sense of common experience within the black Atlantic. In a late 1990s essay, Mantia Diawara has beautifully spoken about the impact of James Brown on previous generations in his native Mali and about Malik Sidibe, Malik Sidibe's captures of that cultural assimilation by the Malian youth in the 1960s. In the same way, the central place that music played in Congolese emancipation cannot be overstated. The most blatant evidence of that is, of course, the song Independence Cha Cha that I could have chosen to play at the beginning, uh, the song Independence Cha Cha by the Grand Calais Orchestra. The song became the anthem of Congo's decolonization, but it also became famous throughout the continent. Independence Cha Cha is an example of the famous Congolese rumba of, um, that you have listened at the beginning, if you were here a few minutes before we started. Congolese rumba, which is a black diasporic music par excellence for its metissage of Congolese and Afro-Cuban elements. Jean de Parra and Congolese rumba musicians shared a same space, namely Kinshasa nightlife because it broke the curfew imposed by the Belgian administration, musicians and their main portraitist, De Parra, participated in the daily transgression that paved the way for independence. Also, lyrics were not infrequently subversive. And for instance, in 1955, the famous song, Atandele, Mokili Ekobaluka, or Sooner or Later, the world will change was released and it resonated as a call to the ears of De Barra and his customers. More fundamentally, in spite of the colonial authorities' effort to keep the Congo as closed as possible, music could hardly be kept insulated from exchanges with neighboring countries and the largest world. And again, the sense of belonging to a larger movement and a larger black space through music played a part in the wind of emancipation that blew over the continent. De Barra was also for a time, the portraitist of Congolese national treasure, the musician Franco, also known as the sorcerer of the guitar. Even after colonialism, Franco's independence of spirit made that in 1978, he was imprisoned for two months by um, then Zaire's president, uh, Mobutu Sese Seko, for some lyrics to two of his songs. The exception that De Barra's work embodies in the landscape of post-independence African photography is the unapologetic sexual freedom that women display in front of his lens. Even the most romantic images in photo Cameroon remain very chaste compared to many of the paras. In his photographs, ladies posed in such liberated ways that more than 30 years later, he still forbade the public disclosure of some of these images out of consideration for his models. Belgian colonial administration frequently vilified Leopoldville's black women for being freely in charge of their own sexuality, 
whether they made commerce out of it or not. If these women were the undeniable victims of uh, patriarchy, the colonial, Christian, uh, and that of the largely male majority of the indig indigenous quarters of Leopoldville, the Paras female subjects nevertheless made an inhibited spectacle of their sensuality that repudiated all of the female models with which they were presented. If the time that followed political independence was indeed a time for the remaking of the continent and the building of nations in Cameroon and in the Congo, it seems that the creation of the national subject started also with the remaking of the body and its display in the photo studio. It is not difficult to see that the performances of the body before the lens of another African man was a collaborative construction of post-colonial masculinity. Interestingly, the very same picture makers were creating the citizen for official documents alongside their private unadministrative self and the shaping of national identities may be less dichotomous than the result of an opposition between public and private spheres. A sense of the emancipated self was acquired through man's self-possession of physical force through claiming one's own beauty with the important difference that for the female clientele of the Barra, sexual freedom was also part of photographic worth subjects. Music and musicians, both at around the time of independence and later on the continent and in the diaspora, were tools of resistance, subversion, but also of the rise of global blackness and a history of African photography in relation to music would certainly be extremely revealing. As a conclusion, and as seen on this image, African self-representations are nourished by a cohabitation of a contrasted range of visual sources. From a calendar with Michael Jackson uh, in tight jeans on the left, to Catholic iconography with the Virgin Mary, the crucifixion, the Holy Spirit, uh, and the Last Supper in this case. Sufficiently important for this young man to ask to be photographed in front of them and placed above the intimate space of his bed, all, the all these references remind us that dreaming oneself in Africa has never been the result of a binary process, but well, the sum of a myriad of signs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Sandrine, for that wonderful presentation. That was fantastic. It was such a treat to get to see the work of these Congolese photographers. Also, I had never seen those photos before. They're 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 fantastic. <laughs> um, so I want to um, urge some of our guests today to you know put some questions in the Q and A. While we're waiting on that, I'm gonna I'm gonna start us off because I have. Um, I have multiple questions. All of them are very poorly formed, I will say, but <laughs> you've got me thinking about a whole bunch of different things, you know. Um, the one that I'm sort of actually uh, comes to mind first is is um, looking at the differences between these these photographers, these Congolese photographers, and then the photographers represented in Photo Cameroon is, um, you know, all three of the photographers in Photo Cameroon are really working pretty pretty strictly in a in a studio. Kind of studio portraiture setting and so what is what was the 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 world of photography like in the congo right around independence were these photographers working um in the community were they working sort of taking photographs of typically people of their own age group was this sort of like a youth pursuit like we see with with cd bay's work or um you know is this sort of them photographing their community and that's why there is also this in some ways um you know, maybe that trans, maybe not transgressive, but the, the sexuality is able to come forth in these photos of women more easily because they are working with people who are age mates, essentially. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
I think probably the photographers that I selected to speak about today are those who are you know, known for their studio practice in the city of Leopoldville and then Kinshasa. Uh, interestingly, Ambroise Ganmoko's uh, studio was called Studio 3C. And then when, uh, when the, the country was renamed, it was called Studio 3Z. So it's also uh, what was renamed Zaire. It was called Studio 3Z. So it's interesting to see how the studio actually followed, you know, the the the, the transformation of the uh, of the independent country. And so um, he photographed certainly. Uh, I, I'm talking about Ambroise Gaimoko. He was certainly, and I think it's true for um, a lot of studio portraits that very often, especially the youth, prefers to be photographed by people their age because. For the you know the same they, they they are in the same wavelength they understand each other and so certainly that was the case for Ambroise Gamoko. Jean de Parra is um, very interesting because he had uh, his own studio uh, in Kinshasa, but he practiced a lot of you know uh, he practiced a lot outside of his studio, and really um, he was a night bird. <laughs> you know he was uh, the the name of his studio uh, was um, Jean Whiskey de Parra. So. He was he was a partier. He was <laughs> someone who liked to to drink, to party, and so I think also because of his nature, he was drawn to these sorts of places, and so he really made a uh, nighttime in Kinshasa uh, his playground. And of course, for us with this historical perspective, it's extremely interesting because, of course, in this sort of setting, you encountered a certain type of characters, new musicians. Uh, also, white Belgian people who transgressed, you know, this uh, this color line and spent time in the quote unquote indigenous quarters, uh, prostitutes as well, uh, you know, people working in bars, and so you have this sort of uh, population that you that came to life really, uh, really at night, and so it probably also explains uh, why he photographed the sort of subject that he photographed. That's so interesting. Um, so we've gotten a couple questions here um, from Margot Laverne. Uh, thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. You uh, observed that uh, Jean Depera started ch uh, changing the codes of portrait, of uh, producing a kind of emancipated portrait, as you called it, um, even before independence. So, um, so Margot is asking, in your opinion, when did these change, changes start? Um, when can we consider that the transition from colonial portrait to post-colonial portrait really started? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question, thank you. Um, I actually uh, wrote an, uh, a small paper about the fact that I think, especially when it comes to Jean de Barat, this sort of watershed moment of independence is not as visible and that what he was portraying before independence was a vision of independence. Sure. So um, it's and an, an it's also because you know, as I said, working at night that was a moment of transgression. You know, by definition, he was very much in touch with the people. Uh, I mean, at least the, the 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 nighttime people who were the most inclined to transgress to transgression, to not respecting. Uh, colonial rule. So I don't, and I think it's probably true for a lot of different photographers in a lot of different countries. I don't think that people woke up the day after independence doing radically different portraiture, right? right? Uh, a lot of it, a lot of elements were present before, you know, they pushed um, toward this more immense, to, toward this emancip emancipation. It took place visually, it took place in many different, you know, media, music, as I said, and, uh, and of course, it's much more um, gradual <laughs> than, than a certain change. Uh, and it's particularly true, I think, of, uh, of Jean de Parra, yeah. We have time for one more question. Um, and we have, thankfully, one more question. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so this is from BC. Um, thank you for pointing out the theme of self-possession found in post-colonial African photography. Do you continue to see this theme appear in contemporary work by African artists? I think so, yes, definitely. Um, I think there's in contemporary photography, uh, a big part of it is also the sort of affirmation of uh, you know, uh, Africanity, of, of blackness, um, for for male and, and female practitioners. Um, 
I also think that there is a sort of movement also towards not feeling uh, compelled to, you know, to respond to um, any past uh, representations of okay. Africans or, or Africa. So I think it's also a very interesting trend, you know, because we feel that there's not, uh, there's no longer this burden of representation. A lot of young photographers feel free to uh, both actually, both African and African diasporic, uh, feel free to explore different aspects of their identities without feeling compelled to respond to anything. And I think it's a really, really welcome uh, progression and, and evolution in uh, contemporary African photography, but it's it's definitely uh, necessary and still and still very present. Awesome! Thank you so much, Sandrine, for your time today and for sharing your research with us. And it was so intriguing to see these commonalities found in early photography across the continent. So thanks for sharing that with us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. And thanks, Erica, for um, joining us in conversation with Sandrine and um, leading us through that Q&A. Appreciate you spending your time with us today. I mean, I was just excited to get to hear Sandrine talk about all of this. This is pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to everyone who joined us. This program has been recorded and it can be found immediately on our Facebook if you're really trying to share it soon. Otherwise, it'll be on our, on our um, Instagram and on the Fowler website in the coming days for you to revisit and share as you see fit. And we hope that you'll join us for our next program. You can find details on our closing slide. And then we hope you have a great day. See you next time. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.